For many people, especially those who were children in the 80s, the NES was the pinnacle of home gaming entertainment. That's what we're going to talk about today. A hands-on, physical discussion about the first major home programmable console from Nintendo, the Nintendo Entertainment System. What's up, everybody? My name is Fortifier, and welcome to the first episode of System Shock. Now, this is a strange, different series, and it's got me in front of the camera, which isn't something I've done, at least not in a long time. Uh, System Shock is a project I've carried for a while because I never knew how I wanted to implement it, and I figured, what better time to do that than now, right? So System Shock, as a series, I want it to be the one-stop shop for everything you would need pertaining to one console. We're going to take a look at the controllers, the games, the console itself, a little bit of history, and when push comes to shove, we're going to take a look at troubleshooting and how to hook it up. All of those things in one confined video. That's what we're doing here today. Now, the NES or the Gray Box or the Nintendo Entertainment System or the NES, whatever you want to call it, was one of the first consoles I purchased whenever I started getting into collecting retro games. I paid roughly $160 for it. Didn't really know if that was a good price at the time. It's just what I found on eBay and I bought five games from a local game store, the first three Mario games and Zelda 1 and 2. Right? Fun games. Now, my collection has grown exponentially. I own 64 consoles and more games than I'm comfortable admitting. Thankfully, I have a very patient wife. You know, some people work on cars, some people do drugs. I like video games. True story. So what is this gray box of plastic? Why is it so important? How did it single-handedly save a generation, right? How did it create all of the franchises that we not only love, but our children love as well? What is this? This is the NES, and it was Nintendo's first home programmable video game console. Not their first, but their first home programmable one. Let's do a little bit of Nintendo history. Nintendo had a rich history in Japan, from Hanafuda cards to love hotels to a taxi cab service. There wasn't much that Nintendo didn't do, however the transition to gaming came around the late 60s when a guy by the name of Gunpei Yokoi was hired to maintain the assembly line machines necessary to manufacture playing cards. Hiroshi Yamauchi, the president of Nintendo, decided that Nintendo needed a gaming department, and who better to place in that position than Gunpei Yokoi? Once he assumed that role, he led the charge to create tons of electro-optical entertainment devices, toys, and games. In the 70s, the Magnavox Odyssey and Atari Home Pong consoles were the rage, and Nintendo wanted to partake in that, reaching out to Mitsubishi Electric to create the first microprocessors for a line of home consoles. The first was the Nintendo Color TV Game 6, which offered six variants of Pong, which wasn't abnormal because in the first generation of gaming, Pong was used and abused to no end. This carried over for their 1978 release of the Color TV game 15, which was basically the same concept, just with 15 different variations. Then they hired this dude named Shigeru Miyamoto, and he was involved with creating this racing console known as the Color TV game Racing 112. Then they decided to sell a breakout clone in 1979 called the Color TV game Block Breaker, and the final major first generation console from Nintendo would be known as the Computer TV game but it had a limited release, and finding any information about it is tremendously difficult. Finally, after all of these saturated sins of mankind ran their course, Nintendo watched as Atari Shock spread across the United States. So what was Atari Shock? Atari Shock was the, I guess, colloquial name from the outside looking in of the American video game crash of 1984, 1983. I always get those years mixed up. I'm sure somebody down in the comment section will be like, you're an idiot. They do it quite often. I'm okay with it. Anyway, Atari Shock happened whenever a bunch of second generation consoles, namely the Intellivision, ColecoVision, and Atari 2600, released tons of games on very low quality standards. And what happened is, is that they created a bubble and that bubble kept on expanding until the industry crashed. Nintendo learned a very valuable lesson from this and that was the importance of quality control and restrictions when it came to releasing games. So how did Nintendo bring the NES to America? It wasn't just put on the shelf at KB Toys or Babbage's or EB Games like modern consoles are done today. The second generation of gaming carried massive implications on public interest in video games. So what Hiroshi Yamauchi, the Nintendo president at the time, decided to do is he put Famicom hardware in the arcade, specifically the Nintendo Versus system. And a lot of our favorite franchises did start in the arcades. Versus Excitebike, 
versus Gradius versus Super Mario Brothers versus Hogan's Alley, you name it, it was likely on that system before the NES was released, formally. After the US markets fell in love with the Nintendo Versus system, they yanked the NES right out of the arcades, plopped it down in our living room, and that's really all that you need to know. But if you are curious about a more in-depth history of Nintendo during the third generation of gaming, feel free to check out the third generation's episode, which is all about that. Cool? Enough out of me. Let's hook it up. This is my NES 001. The NES weighs around 42.7 fluid ounces, according to my wife's scale that I definitely stole for the purpose of this video. That translates to just shy of three pounds. It's supposed to weigh five pounds according to the specifications, but I guess mine went on a diet. In terms of size, the NES is three and a half inches high and 10 inches wide, meaning that it fits very well on the shelf. It was designed with space in mind. The top lid is plastic and so is the bottom, although the bottom feels a little bit more durable maybe to deal with the minimal heat that it produces. On the front, we have one of two indications of the name of the console right there on the lip. If you lift that little flap up, that is the input location for your game. You just slide it in to the low insertion force tray, which is outfitted with a 72 pin connector and press down. We have a power indicator window, which flashes red when there's trouble and remains steady red when the console is receiving power. Next to that, we have the power button and the reset button. There are two controller ports, and I want to point out that Nintendo has historically used proprietary connections that look an awful lot like Lego rejects. If we flip it on its side, we see the two dedicated outputs, audio and video. You're probably wondering, where's the white? I remember a yellow, red, and white cable. Well, I'm sure you did, because you were likely born in the age of stereo sound. This is mono sound. The red is mono audio, and the yellow is for the video. On the back, we have our AC adapter. The adapter that shipped with the NES was the NES002, which is 9 volts AC at 1.3 amps. We also have a channel switch. The two options are channel 3 and channel 4. For anyone who was confused by this, back in the day, many people used RF because VCRs were kind of a luxury, at least in my case. We had to tune our TVs to channel 3 or 4 for the signal to come through our coax and I'll explain what that means when we hook it up. Finally, we have the RF switch, which just pushed the signal out through RF. The final side of the NES, it really isn't significant and it has nothing of importance, but on the bottom, a little bit of a different story. For starters, we have a FCC ID. The Grant T ID in this case is Bravo Mike Charlie, and the product code is 9 Bravo Echo Nintendo Echo Tango Sierra. And yes, this ID is still valid after all of these years. It's registered to a Wayne Shirk, who at the time was an employee of Nintendo. Unfortunately, he passed away in 2010, so I can't really ask him anything about it. We have a serial number, November 4141983, which doesn't tell us much about the age of it, because that answer is on the internal motherboard. We also see all the relevant model information and the phone number for Nintendo's customer service and warranty repair, which guess what? It's the same number that they still use to this day. There's also four rubber pegs for stability and an empty space that would have served to be used for an expansion. However, the NES never had any expansions, while the Famicom did. Now bear in mind, there is another version of the NES. It's known as the NES 101 or the Top Loader, but I can't talk about it because I don't own one yet, so... Today we're just going to focus on the front loader. Now let's go ahead and take a look at the controllers. First opinions, shockingly comfortable for being so rigid and rectangular. The cord is roughly 6 feet, which is 3 feet longer than its wired Japanese counterpart. The connector port is also a hard plastic. Look at this Lego, I, I swear to god. The controller is known as the NES 004 and it's encased in plastic with a rough inlay. It offers a plastic D-pad that isn't too stiff, a rubber, select, and start button, which doesn't tend to bind and two plastic buttons, B and A, which are red. The entire assembly is held together by six screws, and in the event that it fails, it's really easy to take it apart. We'll do that in a little bit. Finally, the games. Traditional NES games are gray, roughly six inches in length, and roughly more than four inches wide. I don't know where my tape measure is, so I use ye olde thingy to determine the size. On the front, we have the artwork, and a nice little arrow that tells you which end you're supposed to shove inside the NES. At the bottom, the connectors are exposed, so this does subject your games to accumulation of dust, but the shape of the cartridges do make for an easy way to store them on the shelf. On the back, we have a few warnings, including one that I ignore daily, and some extra information about the ROM boards. For example, my copy of Ice Hockey is Revision A, while my copy of Akari Warriors doesn't mention this at all. 
Another point of conversation is the difference between three screw and five screw games. Now, many people will say five screw games are rare, but most of the time that isn't the case. It's just one of those WADA VGA bullshit things that inflate the collection market for no reason. If you don't feel like taking your games off the shelf and you want to see which ones are five screw and which one are three, the tops of five screw games don't have these little clips that are present on three. That's something you know now. Now, before taking this thing apart, I can comfortably say that NES games themselves, they're kind of an anomaly, kind of a waste of space. This is a Famicom cart. Inside, the ROM board takes up the majority of the space. To show you how much space is being wasted, let's pop one on top of another, and you can just see how much empty space is there. Don't believe me? Take a look at this picture. That's a lot of empty room. Well, if you've made it this far, I'm going to go ahead and assume that you want to actually play your NES, so... Let's go ahead and hook it up. First, plug in your adapter to the outlet. Make sure the other end is in the NES at the AC power section. Press the power button to make sure the indicator turns red. If it does, you have power. Turn it off. Now we need to focus on output. If you're a fan of RF, then congrats. You're a person of culture, and I salute you for it. At the same time, you need to go lay down. You know your back hurts. For starters, you'll need the NES RF switch. This little gray box does the function of previous RF switches that used to just have like these nodules that would change between the game and the TV, but this one does it automatically, which I find to be very interesting. First, we need to hook up our TV, make sure it has power. It does. Now we need to plug in the RCA cable to the spot marked RF switch on the console. Yeah, I know it says control deck. No, nobody calls it that, but that's what it's called on the switch. Finally, we need to plug in the coax to the antenna in the back of the TV. Then set your TV to channel 3 or 4, depending on what you have your NES set to. And finally, hit the power button. You should see your game. RF is a very rudimentary and outdated method of enjoying your NES, but if you're loyal to the original way of gaming from the early 80s, this is the way. Now, if you want to do it in a modern way, the most modern way of hooking up an NES to a TV is just to use your AV cables. For this, a majority of TVs already had line imports. In my case, I have two, so I don't need a VCR in this particular instance. On the NES, we want to hook up the red RCA cable to the audio out and the yellow to the video out. On our TV, we want to hook up the appropriate red cable to the red hole and the yellow to the yellow hole. Tune your TV to the appropriate channel, which in my case was video one, and boom. We're playing the game. Now, in theory, you should be able to just in and out through a VCR, but my Hitachi VCR has seen better days, trust me. Just put it directly from the NES to the TV. Now, if you're streaming this, you're gonna need an upscaler or some way to capture AV signals. I personally use a RetroTINK 5X, but there are cheaper options available. Be very weary of AV to HDMI devices because they are cheap, and made in the thousands to make a quick profit. I've had zero luck with them. If you want to go that route, I do suggest researching your options. So you watch this whole video and everything is hooked up correctly and your NES still isn't working right. Oh no, what a tragedy. Let's get it fixed. First and foremost, make sure to check your power, inputs and outputs. Power is plugged in, we're good to go. Now let's check our outputs, all right? We're hooked up correctly, so that leaves our input. NES games are notorious for glitching out if there's even a minor amount of dust on the contact, so let's, uh, well, you know what to do. <laughs> That's the age-old way of fixing NES cards, taking them out and blowing them. While it's a good quick fix, over time this can damage your carts due to perspiration from your breath, but you know all of us old guys, we don't really care. If you want to do a thorough cleaning, then violate Nintendo's rule number three and grab some isopropyl alcohol and a Q-tip and go to town on the contacts. After that, pop it in, push down, and press power. Well, that's weird. A red screen. These screens happen quite often, it's just a product of the time, so let's press the reset button. What if that doesn't work? Well, over time, the 72-pin connector goes bad from being bent over and over and over again, so pop the game back up and gently wiggle it just a fraction forward and retry the reset power cycle process. That should fix it. Now, what if your NES is blinking? Well, that's its own beast. The NES has a built-in chip to avoid unlicensed software known as the 10NES chip. It's a CIC checksum chip that acts as a lockout for bootleg software. 
If you put in a game and power it on, the 10 NES chip checks the values from the ROM board, and if it mismatches, it doesn't allow the game to read, and instead makes the light blink due to a constant power cycle. Now, certain companies did get around this by either A, sending a voltage spike to override the chip like Wisdom Tree, or B, by reverse engineering the chip to combat it like the Rabbit chip on Tengen games. It does work as advertised, but over time, the 10 NES chip can fail and start making even licensed games not work, so I cut mine. Think of the 10 NES as a lock and the ROM as the key, but then that key breaks. So in looking at the motherboard, this right here is the 10 NES chip. There are 16 pins, and if you cut the fourth pin from the left on the bottom, you will forever disable the 10 NES and completely remove any and all blinking NES issues forever. But how do you take the NES or the controller apart? So I don't have the best microphone for this, so we're doing this ye old fashioned way, either by going through the camera's microphone or through the hot shoe up there. Uh, fingers crossed they work. If they don't, well, fuck, I'm sorry. Um, I'm gonna put y'all down over here because my neck doesn't feel the greatest today. And I'm gonna walk y'all through taking apart the NES. So for starters, flip it over, put it on its bottom. There's six screw holes. One, two, three, four, five, six. Let's take those apart. I've already done it. There you go. Six screws out. Now you got your lid. Use this to, to hold all your screws so you don't lose all of them like I did. Get in there. Now what we're left with is the top half of the NES. This big thing here is an RF shield. That's gonna be our next step to get it off. And to get it off, we need to get off a few screws. One, two, three, they're down there. Then there's two down here, one, two, and then two on the side, one, two. Now with those screws off, we can lift up the RF shield. It's literally just held down by the screws, so we lift up this side, pull out, there you go. Now what we're left with is the low insertion tray, which we're gonna take out next, and then a few screws that will physically hold the motherboard in place, namely this one right down here. I don't know if you can see it right down there, cool? Now the screws I'm taking out for this are on the top side. They're on each side of these. Like there's still one screw right here. The other one I just took out there. Now these two screws are noticeably longer than the other ones. All right, now with that screw loose, what we're able to do is push up on our low insertion force tray and just pull it out. Goodness, Jesus. There we go. It's kind of cool to see how that works, huh? All right, now if you're just trying to clean your 72 pin connector, this is the best way to do it. The only thing that's holding this on is on the other side of here, but if you really, really wanted to get into there, you could just get alcohol, which is great for electronics, and just clean this up, right? Just clean it up, just scrub it a little bit. But if we're going for a deep clean, then we need to take out one more screw, and it's that screw that's down there. All right, now that we got this taken off, this is the motherboard, well specifically this side is the motherboard. And we need to get this off, but before we do that, we have to unplug some things. So we've got a few connectors on the side. We need to pull out our player one connector. It should just wiggle off gently. And then this is our player two connector right here, player two. It's noticeably longer than player one. Let's go and pull it out. And then the last one is our power cable. We're just gonna go ahead and pull that out. Just gently pull that out. Now because that's out, we can get rid of this. Woo! 
And here you go, the the meat and bones of um of the NES right here. This is responsible for your childhood. Just this. All right, now we're gonna put everything back together because it needs to be put back together. We don't wanna expose this to the elements much longer than we need to. So we're gonna start off by putting the bottom RF shield. The bottom one's easy to know because it's got these tabs that are gonna hold on to the interface right here. So it goes right on this side. Just place it down like that and push, easy. Again, this one is held on by tension, so uh, don't bend it or anything, it should just come right off. These are our three tension points right here. Let's go and plug in our power. Player two, which is the long one, remember it's the long one. Finally, player one, which will go right here. Now that that's on, flip it over. run our cables kind of gently, gently through there to the best of our ability, Just kind of shove it down there, let it rest, make sure everything goes back where it needs to. All right, let's go and put our screws in. We're going to start by putting in the bottom one right there. Now we're going to install our low insertion tray. Basically the opposite, make sure it's open. It'll be much easier if it's open, so open it up. Just kind of wiggle it on. There we go. Push it down. And remember, get our two get our two silver screws. They're much longer than the other ones. And they're gonna go on the side right here. Now when you put in these front two screws, make sure you don't over tighten them because if you do, this won't stay down, right? So we wanna make sure that we, we don't tighten them too much because here's what happens if we tighten it too much. Right, so you wanna make sure you do keep them kind of loose, maybe about three, four turns. That way when you push it, it stays down. Now we're gonna go ahead and get this on. Just pop it down. And we put in those six screws all over again. Now that we got these screws on, this isn't going anywhere. So we're gonna go ahead, take our screws out of our lid that way they don't fall in there and we have to do all this all over again. Pop it on, gently flip the console over and drop our screws right back in. There we go, let's plug it in. All right, so for the controller, it's pretty much the same thing. We're just removing six screws. So make sure you get a right size screwdriver. Uh, this is a pretty small screw, so we're gonna go ahead and do one. All right, so once you have all the screws, the faceplate literally just comes off. What we're left with is this really interesting um, controller, right? So wires are routed in a very specific way. But the good news is, is that when you take this off, it's kind of self-explanatory. goes through the posts again. All right, now that we've got these, we're gonna gently lift this up, very gently, or we can just let it fall out. Very gently, come on. 
Just get your finger under there and gently press up, and it should just come with you. Do it on this side too. There we go. All right, so what you'll see on the inside is that we've got two sets of rubber pads that will, you know, go bad at some point. We got our start and select pads, and we got our two buttons, right? So these just pop right out. And there you go. This is the shell of a controller. Pretty simple. Uh, if you ever need to replace the pads, I feel like these are the things that will always go no matter what controller you're playing with because we've beaten the shit out of those buttons through the years. So let's go ahead and rebuild it, right? So we start by dropping our red button in, red button in, D-pad in, orientation does not matter, it's a D-pad, cool. Now we're going to put our A and B pads back where they were, right, the little buffer pads, and then we're going to do the same for our D-pad. Our D-pad will go like so, just pop it on, right? And give it a little push, not much though. And then for start and select, I'm gonna pop those in as well. Now the important thing is, is that you always want your rubber pads to go into the post, right? And they'll get pushed down when we put the motherboard back on. But if you're wondering like, oh hey, how's the orientation for this? Because this can be put in, you know, upside down. See that little hole right there? You want that hole to go right there. All right, now we're gonna put it back together. You got the board in your hand. There is an orientation that we wanna pay attention to, right? This is obviously the D-pad. These are A and B and then start select over here. So we're gonna go ahead and make sure that this gets put down like so, right? And push, it should snap. Just push around a little bit. Now we're gonna wire our wires back in. Remember how I said it's got a specific curvature? We're gonna make sure that A it goes in here. Push and push. And we're good to go. Controller is now reassembled. We're gonna make sure that Nintendo is facing to the sky. And screw it back in. All right, time for the last piece of the equation, the games. Now, if you're taking apart a five, five screw game, you're in luck, it's Phillips. So we're gonna go ahead and do that. Uh, or flathead, my bad. We're gonna go ahead and pop this open. All right, they're all out. That was far more difficult than it needed to be. So five screw game, five flathead screws, kind of a pain in the ass, but check this out. Will you marry me? She said yes. So this is the, uh, this is the insides. Remember how I told you that it wastes so much space? It really does. Like this is unnecessarily large, and I guess it was just created for the aesthetic, but this is the entirety of a game, an NES game, right in the palm of your hands, butt-ass naked as the day it was born off the assembly line. So, um, yeah. That's that, and it's easy. You just pop it back in. There are notches, so they, they fit naturally back where you took them out. Then you just drop it down. There you go. Put your screws back in. Are you ready for another long montage? Because it was a pain in the ass getting it out. I'm pretty sure it's gonna be just as fun getting them in. Now with the three screw, you're going to need what's called a game bit, and it looks something kind of like this. I know it's kind of hard to get a zoom in on that, but uh, yeah, a game bit and a driver, and you just kind of pop them on there, like so, and you just turn. Now if you've got a screwdriver that fits this, awesome. Other than that, usually these aren't tight enough to where like it's, it's a problem. So unlike the fives, this doesn't just come straight off, so what we have to do is we have to lift and then gently pull back and then it'll come off, right? And it's the same principle, just a, a tiny little tiny little thing. There's a lot of information on these boards too. You can find out if, you're, if your game is real or fake. If there's wires coming out, then it's probably fake, but yeah. There you go. Battletoads, one of the hardest games in the palm of my hand right now. It's taking everything in my power not to throw it down the garbage disposal. Put it back in, flip it over, drop it down. All right, make sure it slides in. Wiggle, wiggle, push. And you're good to go. Tighten down those screws. And that's it. 
good to go. Yep. Sweet. And that's basically all of the topics that we can cover if we want to just take a direct look at the NES. I hope that you enjoyed this. I know it's different. Trust me. I know it's different. It's different for me too, but different is good, especially when you're trying out different perspectives, different shows, different ideas. This is something that I wanted to do for a long time. So what can you do for me? Usually I say, hey, hit that subscribe button. Yeah, you should. We do a lot of things here. I usually say you should give me the thumbs up. It does help with the algorithm. Usually I say, hey, comment down below. I would love to read your comments. I interact with everybody that takes the time to talk to me. But the most important thing for this episode is not the subscriptions, it's not the thumbs up, and it's definitely not the comments. What it is, is your feedback. I want to make this particular episode matter to more people than it usually would. Like, I know most of my audience is in their 30s to 50s. That's fine, because that's the niche that I, that I appeal to because of the context of what we talk about. But this video will hopefully be on the internet for my life, my children's lives, and their children's lives. So because of that, your feedback will be tremendously valuable um, if I do decide to continue doing this particular style of show. Now, don't be too mean to me. I'm just a boy, all right? This was a pilot episode. This is my first time ever doing it, right? So don't don't kick me in the balls too hard. You, I mean, you can. I got a vasectomy. They didn't, ain't nothing coming out of them. But that doesn't mean I like it, okay? Don't kick me. As always, from my family to your family, good energy, good vibes, fortify out, keep the flames of hope burning, and the flames of retro gaming burning even stronger. Take care, guys.